both of our next two videos are about inverse functions. So I'm going to give you a quick reminder of what we're talking about when we use the term inverse function. The idea behind any function, as we learned in Algebra 2 and again in Precalc, is you take an input, you plug it into some function, and you get an output as a result. The idea of an inverse function is to undo whatever that function machine just did. So if you take whatever that result was and you plug it into the inverse function, that machine will spit out the thing that you started with. So an inverse is a way to undo any other function. It works for trig in particular. If you think about a trig function, like a sine function, you take an angle, you plug it into a sine function, and out comes the sine, some decimal. It's really a ratio, but usually it's irrational, so we write it as a decimal. The idea of the inverse sine is if you take a decimal, some number between negative 1 and 1, and you plug it into the inverse sine, which we sometimes call inverse sine, and sometimes we call it arc sine, that function will give you the angle back. So in other words, the inverse sine of a decimal of a number is the angle whose sine is that decimal. So it works for all the other trig functions too. So our function here, the inverse secant of x, is the same idea. y is equal to the inverse secant of x, which means y is the angle and the x here, the input into the inverse secant, is some secant. Which, unlike sine, it's not always a decimal between negative 1 and 1. It's never between negative 1 and 1. So we have y equals C, the inverse secant of x, which remember is the same thing as saying the arc secant of x. And what we're going to do is find the derivative of that function. In order to do it, we're going to rewrite that. So y is the angle whose secant is x. So y is an angle. I'm going to draw a triangle with an angle in it that has a y. Notice that this is a right triangle, so I should label it that way. And the secant of this angle y, remember that's the output to my inverse secant, which means this angle's secant is x. Uh, remember the definition of secant? It's the reciprocal of cosine. So cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So the secant is equal to the hypotenuse over the adjacent leg. So the hypotenuse of this right triangle divided by the adjacent leg, the leg that's adjacent to the angle y, must be x, or x over 1. So the hypotenuse is x, that length is 1. This is an angle whose secant is x. So what I'm going to do is write this the other way around. If y is the inverse secant of x, then x is equal to the secant of y. That's how inverse functions work. So we're going to use the same trick to find the derivative of this. It's not really a trick. I'll call it a method. The same method to find the derivative of this function, this y that we're looking for, as we did to find the derivative of logs a couple of lessons ago. We are going to use that method called implicit differentiation. The basic idea of implicit differentiation is if two things are equal to each other, x and the secant of y, then their derivatives in respect to x must also be equal to each other. So we'll take the derivative in respect to x of both sides, the derivative in respect to x of x is just 1, and the derivative in respect to x of the secant of y is the secant of y times the tangent of y. Almost. Just keep in mind, because of the chain rule, this y is the inside function which means that the derivative is going to need to be multiplied by 
the derivative of the inside function, dy dx. Which means we can then solve for dy dx, which was our goal here, right? We wanted to find the derivative. So the derivative of y in respect to x, we can get that dy dx by itself just by dividing both sides by the secant of y times the tangent of y. We saw this with the logs also last week. We don't really want to have y in the answer for the derivative of y in respect to x. So we're going to see if we can replace those y's with x's. Luckily, we can because the y and the x, they're all talking about the angle and the hypotenuse of this triangle right here. So we can figure out what the secant of y is. I mean, truth is we already know the secant of y is equal to x because we said that. So we can replace that secant of y with x. And the tangent of y, we can figure that out too. Remember, the tangent of any angle, and our angle that we're concerned with here is y, is the opposite leg divided by the adjacent leg. So we just need to figure out what this opposite leg is. Well, we have tools for that. This is a right triangle. So the, the three sides of the right triangle must fit the, hypot the Pythagorean theorem. So x, x squared must be equal to the sum of the squares of these two sides. We can write that out as an equation and solve for it. This side right here must be the square root of x squared minus 1. And if you're not sure where I got that from, I'll just call that side a for a second. a squared plus 1 squared must equal x squared. And so a squared must equal x squared minus 1. And so a is equal to the square root of x, minus, x squared minus 1. So that's how I figured out that side right there. Well, that is the opposite leg. The opposite divided by the adjacent would be equal to the tangent of the angle y. So that's what I'm going to need to put in here. The tangent of y is the square root of x squared minus 1. And so that is the derivative of the secant of the inverse secant of x in respect to x. With one tiny little catch. Not quite done yet, actually. The only problem with this is that um, the secant, the input into the inverse secant, this x right here, it could be positive or negative. Right? You because you have you can have an angle whose secant is negative. That means you must be able to find the inverse secant of a negative number to figure out what that angle was. So x could be negative. The problem is that in this particular example, dy dx can't be negative. Because if you look at the graph I have here of the arc secant of x, you can notice that this function is always increasing for its entire domain which means no matter what, the derivative must be positive. So we are going to fix that little problem by saying that the derivative of the arc secant isn't, um, is going to be kept positive by putting an absolute value around that x. So that is the derivative of the arc secant. We can use a similar strategy to find the derivative of arc sine or arc tangent. And I'll leave you to do that on your own. I know one was in the video notes already for t before today. But once we've done all those, you'll see that these are the six um, derivatives of inverse trig functions. They're worth memorizing. I think you have to have them memorized. Well, I'm not going to say that. They're worth memorizing. But there are actually only three things to memorize, because I want you to notice that the derivatives of the inverse co-angles, or as it says in the text here, the derivative of each co-inverse function, so that's sine versus cosine, notice how they are just opposites of each other, right? It's just the negatives that are here. That's it. So if you know the derivative of arc sine, you know the derivative of arc cosine. If you know the derivative of arc tangent, you know the derivative of arc cotangent. Once you know those six, you can find the derivatives of more complicated functions that use inverse cosine or inverse sine or anything like that, just using the chain rule or the product rule or anything else that we've seen before.
So here's the example. If you want to find the derivative of the inverse cosine of e to the 3x, well, the inverse cosine is the outside function, and the e to the 3x is the inverse, I'm sorry, the inside function. So to find y prime, we would take the derivative of the in outside function, I'll do that in green, the derivative of the arc cosine, so we're going to use this, is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, but remember the key words to the chain rule is we take the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside. Remember that e to the 3x is going to show up in here. So negative 1 over 1 minus e to the 3x squared. And let me just put that squared a little bit closer to the e to the 3x so it doesn't look so confusing. But because of the chain rule, we have to also multiply by the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of e to the 3x is 3e to the 3x. And so when all is said and done, put this all together, we have negative 3e e to the 3x divided by the square root of 1 minus e to the 6x. Notice where that 6x came from. When you have a power raised to a power, you multiply the two exponents together. So 3x times 2 is 6x. And that's it. It's worth pointing out that if you're stuck, you can always go back to the triangle. So this one's a slightly easier example than the last one to do without the triangle. But if you're always stuck, go to the triangle. If you're not sure, the inverse sine of 4x, how to find the derivative, go to the triangle. Rewrite it as a sine function, the sine of our angle y, which remember is opposite over hypotenuse, is 4x over 1, which means that this other root would be the square root of 1 minus 16x squared, because that's the 4x squared. And we can use implicit differentiation, just like before. That's the key to these problems, if you don't remember the formulas. So the derivative of 4x in respect to x is 4. The derivative of the sine of y is the cosine of y, because of the chain rule, times dy dx. So dy dx by itself is 4 divided by the cosine of y. And to find the cosine of y, we'll just remember it is the adjacent leg, or the leg adjacent to y, this guy, divided by the hypotenuse, which is just 1. So that's 4 over the square root of 1 minus 16x squared. So that's your derivative. And that's it. So if you can't remember the formula, you can always fall back on the triangle as well.